Thank you, Estelle, for agreeing to share with us your thoughts on the changing landscape of equalities and diversity for the arts and the heritage and cultural sectors today. What I'd like to start with first is to ask you if you can tell us about your interest in participation and your vision for supporting and promoting practice for the cultural sectors. Uh, thank you. Um, at the moment, I'm chair of the trustees of the National Coal Mining Museum in Wakefield, which is where I am at the moment. And I'm also a trustee of the Roundhouse in North London and a trustee of the Paul Hamlin Foundation. And all of those are organisations that are obviously cultural organisations, but are absolutely committed to participation. And I suppose seeing the good practice they do has built on the enthusiasm I always had. But if I put that together, I suppose, with my past working jobs, either as a teacher in education or in politics, I think I've always understood or valued that looking outwards, looking to the public, listening and engaging with them is a pretty important way of living in society. I think as myself as well, as I think of my life and the contribution that culture has played to it. As I've got older, if I dare say, I think I've really, really understood that as individuals, as communities and as a society, that civilization and that civic contribution that culture brings is absolutely important to the way we behave and what we do. So bring all those together. I think even though we're in difficult times, participation and engagement with culture is absolutely essential. Thank you, that's really helpful. Could you say what your take is on the changing context for cultural organisations? We're in a, a period of change at the moment. And how do you think this context has changed, particularly in recent years, in terms of the implications for participation for individuals, for communities and so forth? It no doubt is a period of change, but what's new? It's been that way for the past few decades. And sometimes change and the threat of change can frighten people and make them not move make them not do anything. So the challenge is going to be uh, to command the change rather than letting the change command you. And I think one of the ways of doing that is first of all to say, let, let, let's not think about the, the threats at the moment, but the cultural sector has never been stronger than it is at the moment. It has had a period of investment. It's had a massive period of immense achievement. And that's not just me saying it. It's not just the sector saying it. Go to any commentator or anybody in any part of this country and they will tell you that there's never been more opportunities for theatre, dance, museums. There's never been more books. There's never been more activity in libraries. I don't think there's ever been better creativity in our schools. So we go into this period of change coming from a time of great achievement. So we should be strong and we should realise the role that we've got to play. But I don't think I want to hide away from some of the dangers and some of the risks in this period of change. And I think I would put them like this. We're at a join. I think in any period, any part of life, managing those joins is the point at which we can literally, metaphorically fall down the middle. So what's the nature of those joins? I mean, politically, we've got a new government. And I think people in the sector had got used to targets, got used to money coming from the public purse in exchange for agreeing targets. I think you've become very apt at filling in boxes, doing the ticks, making sure that everything is in place. And it's not going to be like that any longer. We've got a clear message from government, which I think they've delivered on in the first year that they've been there, of actually handing over power and autonomy to the sector. So it's not as though nothing will be demanded from the cultural sector, but that message is quite clear. It's up to you to decide how you want to achieve your objectives. That word of autonomy, I think, is going to have some reality behind it. And whereas the sector has always said, leave it to us, the minute that infrastructure of targets goes, actually, it, those safety harnesses have been let loose. So that's the first thing. It is a period of autonomy. And in that period of autonomy, decisions are going to have to be taken about new partnerships that will be made and new structures that will need to be put in place. That's quite exciting. And that's an opportunity to tell you the truth. But what's true is that is being done at a period of financial slowdown, and we've not even started yet, and the end of those years 
of money actually being attached to new initiatives. And that's more worrying, that's not as comforting, because managing change during a period of disinvestment, I think is just an extra challenge and it makes life more difficult than it has been. And the last thing on there is the public. The change isn't just sector and there's a real danger that what happens, you think, heck, everything's changing and you look inward. Or if you continue to look outward, you see people who are also um, making do with a recession, are also having to decide what their priorities are but at the same time, they've had a taste of culture and they know more about cultural opportunity than their parents and their grandparents did. I don't believe that they will want to leave it behind. So what's changed? Lots of things. What's the same? Lots of things. Where does that leave us? It really leaves us asking that we are wise enough to see what skills we will need in the future to meet those in ch challenges but we should be looking forward with the confidence of what our achievements tell us about ourselves over the last 10 or more years. That is a really interesting take because there are so many particularly practitioners out there across libraries, archives and other cultural organisations who are really scared about the cuts. But you're saying that there really is a culture of participation now that's going to see us through the next decade. Yeah, I mean, I'm scared about the cuts as well. You know, let, let me be clear, clear about that. I'm, I'm not saying that the cuts are going to make it easy or that we can do all this without the cuts. What I fear most is that the cuts become the only thing we talk about, and that would be a tragedy. The cuts will make it more difficult, but they don't mean we're scared of our own shadow and that we no longer do anything. And every time we have a discussion, we say, ah, but, or, oh, if only there was money. Ah, don't you remember those days? when there was money come out of DCMS and all the rest of it. And that's my biggest worry, that the cuts are real and the cuts are a challenge. But we've got a responsibility that despite that, we carry on doing what we've been doing and we do it the best we can. Your review for the Arts Council England highlighted the relationship between communities and collections, libraries and museums. And it emphasised cooperation, really, the potential for cooperation and the importance of an active, civically engaged public as partners and co-producers working with cultural organisations. And I wondered if you could say a bit about how a vision, your vision, that you outlined in that report can be delivered successfully so that it becomes embedded as an important part of the future landscape for individuals, for communities working in partnership here. I think this is a really big issue because it's about what kind of sector you want to be, how do you want to describe yourself, what matters most, what's your principles, your values and your priorities. I have to say, when I first became Minister of Arts, it was a, it was a debate I didn't really understand. I, I understood it intellectually but emotionally. I, I never quite understood it because it never quite made sense to me. And I think that's because I'm not naturally of the sector in that I've not worked in the sector or in terms of many people at this conference has been involved as they are. So for me, this old debate between excellence and access and looking inwards and outwards was never real because I always thought they were part and parcel of the same thing. So to have excellence without access, to have access without excellence seemed to me a nonsense. And I do understand that it's a finer debate than that. And I think it's essential that that debate has taken place over the last 10 years. But in terms of where we are now, just the connection of culture with its audiences is absolutely culture, uh, crucial for me. And I use those terms really as synonymous with um, I've got to use some terms and I've chosen to use those, but what I actually mean is theatre with its audiences, libraries with those who visit libraries, museums with its visitors, uh, cultural halls and heritage with those who go there as well. So it really is culture and cultural institutions and cultural activities with those who engage in them. And I do understand and I've, I've learned to value this far more than I did, but that whole process of creating things, of creating a play, of minding an object, of guarding and being the keeper of something that is of historical value. The whole process of writing a book, I can see that that's a process in itself that demands academic excellence, 
that demands artistic talent, that needs the best of what the cultural sector can bring. And that is excellent and we need that. But for me, it doesn't come to life before it engages with the public. And that's why I see it as around. You've got to have all those skills, but you've got to have the public that engages with it. And then the feedback from the public actually goes into that creation again. And so it is that hole and it is that circle. So I'm against actually a culture or cultural activities that don't engage with the public. And I'm against a public engagement that doesn't get fed back into the round. That's, I think, why it's important to me.